Um, it's been a long day, so if you want, you can stretch a little and get ready for the last talk of today. Um, this is going to be packed, a lot of information, so bear with me. Um, so I'm going to talk about getting started with DApps on Ethereum. Um, it stands for Decentralized Apps. Just, yeah, just put it. It's fine. Uh, it stands for Decentralized Apps. So quick show of hands. Who has heard of CryptoKitties? Or maybe even owns a kitty. I do own two. I regret it. Um, so this is one of the, I would say, the first major uh, decentralized app that saw some major traction. Um, what you could do there is you buy cats, you sell cats, you breed cats on the Ethereum blockchain. The interesting thing here is every single cat of that had a unique uh, hash, basically attached to that cat, so it's like a collectible, so to speak. And they increase in price the more demand came in. Um, yeah, some numbers here. There's a TechCrunch article from 4th of December uh, last year. People spent over 1 million USD buying virtual cats on the blockchain. Uh, kind of nuts. I was one of them. I just so regret that. Um, anyways, so I'm going to talk today about how to build this, um, how you can build it yourself, how you can get started building in a decentralized app like this. That's the comment. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little about myself. Uh, who am I? Where do I come from? So I have a background with about, I would say, four years uh, in startups. The first stunt I've done was at NeoReach, uh, an early stage influencer marketing platform that, that I joined as the first hire after the founding team. Um, we literally took the company from a, from a dorm room at Stanford uh, to three million annual revenues uh, after two years. Uh, so that was an interesting journey. Then I packed my bags, flew from San Francisco to Berlin to start a company called Patreon GG. Uh, GG stands for good game. Anyone who is a gamer knows that, hopefully. Um, so this was the market that we in. It was in esports. So uh, we work with, so this is competitive gaming, basically. They're a gamer sitting here, and they play in a stadium like this. Um, it was an interesting journey. It was for about two years. Um, so we built a mobile app to um, basically build a, uh, for like esports fans to build a platform uh, for them. And yeah, so the company alone got some money put the team together, uh, launched the product. Um, eventually, things didn't turn out as I wanted to, so I sold my shares and then moved to Tokyo to join Code Chrysalis. Um, today, I'm not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this, Ethereum. Um, quick show of hands. Who has heard about Ethereum and knows what it is? For? Great. Um, so who has heard about Bitcoin? Probably most people have heard about Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is one of, I would say, bunch of um, uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain uh, projects. Ethereum is another one of them. Today we're not going to talk about Bitcoin at all. We're not going to talk about prices. We will not talk about, uh, I don't know, let's say bubbles. Uh, do I think it's a bubble? Yes, I still think it's a bubble. Um, so we get that out of the way. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about how to build something on the Ethereum blockchain. And I try to stay on the surface of what the blockchain actually is and try to dive deep into the actual code of how to deploy a smart contract, how to write um, your first full stack decentralized app, so to speak. So bear with me, it's gonna be packed with information. It might get overwhelming at some point, um, but that's good, because it means you're learning. Um, first of all, you're gonna start with the internet is broken. Uh, Tsubasa gave good amount of information why that is the case. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. Um, I don't know what those algorithms are. I wish I could see what they optimize for so that I know it better, basically. Um, Next one, paying for trust. Um, let's say there's a middleman like eBay or let's say Uber, Airbnb. Um, they are the middleman in the peer-to-peer -peer transaction. And the reason why they exist is could be convenience, but it's also trust and security. So basically, they make sure that um, this person that sells it to you is a trustworthy person. You get what you're buying, basically. Um, they take a good cut for this, which makes overall more inefficient compared to a pure peer-to-peer -peer transaction because they're taking yeah, an 8% eight, eight cut, I think, is eBay. Yeah. Um, next one, data monopoly. So most companies store their data on all the big uh, cloud storage uh, service. And there's two problems with this. The first one is um, you have a single point of failure. If something breaks there or messes up, your whole thing is down. Um, Tsubasa touched on this. The second one is, Tsubasa touched on this as well, um, all those big tech companies have a bunch of information. So they're data monopolies, and they can do a bunch of interesting stuff with this, if you want it or not. Um, Two days ago or three days ago um, was the, on the news that uh, Google bought data from MasterCard and used that data to basically target you with, with ads. And 
I know for sure that Facebook is also doing some similar data brokerage things to, to, to <coughs> yeah, argue with, with, uh, with ads there. But I'm not going to go too deep into this. That's, that would yeah, be out of scope here. Um, a potential solution to this um, is or could be the Ethereum blockchain. So first of all, what is Ethereum? Um, this is taken from the website. So take this, especially this topic thing, uh, with a grain of salt. Um, Ethereum is a decentralized platform that runs smart contracts, which are applications that run exactly as programmed without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, or third-party interference. Um, I highlighted two things, decentralized platform and smart contracts. So we're gonna talk about what these two things are, and then, yeah, how the other things hopefully become more clear. Um, I just wanna get an understanding of the room. Who does not know what a blockchain is? So it's absolutely no clue. And it's totally fine if you raise your hand. Okay, um, brought an apple. I'll, ex I'll make it really, really simple. I'm not gonna go too deep into blockchains, but I'm explaining to you as if you were five. Um, this is an apple. I have one apple now. What's your name? Samson. Sorry, say again? Samson. Samson. Um, so I have an apple. Samson has zero apples, right? So right now I give this apple to Samson. So he has now one apple. I have zero apples. That's the current state, right? So I now know that I have zero and you have one and you know that you have one and I have zeros. All you who have look, you looked at seen this also knows this. Let's just say someone comes in from outside and this person doesn't really know. And I could go to this person and say, hey, I'm gonna send you, sell you an apple, although I don't have anything, but this person doesn't know. Um, and then this person would say, yeah, sure. And that's a problem, right? So let's, let's rewrite this transaction. Okay, second scenario. I have an apple, you have zero. Um, let's keep all track of how many apples every single person in the room has. So let's say everyone owns a document that has on their phone with every single person's name and count of apples, basically, okay? So I'm gonna give you an apple now. So all our, um, so this, um, let's call it ledger, right? well, let's just call it a piece of paper. So the piece of paper has um, now the information that I have zero and you have one, so this has been updated now. That's the current state. Every single person has access to this. Let's say this person comes in. Uh, <laughs> great timing. Uh, please come, feel free to sit in the front. Um, so what do you think how many apples I have? <laughs> It's fine, you don't know. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's pretend you had this list that we just talked about, and he could just put out his phone and see, oh, Michael has zero apples. I'm not going to buy an apple from you. Um, so this is referred to as the double spending problem. I'm not going to go too deep into this. Um, but this is the basic idea of, of the blockchain, that there's a, um, let's say every person is a node, so a person in the decentralized network, a distributed network, um, similar to IPFS with Subasa. And and we all have that piece of information. And if I were to fake this and say I have 100 apples all of a sudden, you all know that this is wrong and then this information gets disregarded. And yeah, so, and, and also what's interesting to note in the blockchain is that you can't really fake past information. So the state is mutable. And every time something changes or change of transaction or something, um, it gets added to the blockchain in terms of a block. That's why it's a chain of blocks. It's like a linked list if you're familiar with that data structure. Uh, you can keep that apple. <laughs> or you can donate it to anyone. Um, okay, so the difference between centralized and decentralized. So we are all familiar with this probably when there's information sitting on a web server somewhere centrally. Um, in our case of apples, I could just, if I'm the admin here, I could just fake this and say I have 100 apples. It's bad. Um, with this, that was the scenario that I mentioned that every single person has a copy of the current state of what's going on. Um, and faking this here, as I mentioned, is kind of hard because they all say, no, this is wrong and this is wrong. Um, yeah, this is a very simple, basic explanation of this. It can get much more complicated than this, but I hope that makes sense so that we can move on together to the next things. Um, next thing, Ethereum and smart contracts. So Ethereum has something that's called smart contracts. Other blockchain projects also have this, so it's not Ethereum specific. Um, the idea behind this, basically a smart contract is just a bunch of functions that allows you to either write to the blockchain or retrieve information from a blockchain. Um, some people compare this to a vending machine. So let's say you uh, give someone 100 yen and you get something back, Coca-Cola or whatever. Um, so what it does is it's, yeah, as I said, it's a set of, of functions. Um, you could think about it as a class with a bunch of functions in there. And then those functions do something. So either read from the blockchain, let's say you have one Apple, this could be a call to a smart contract. Or also our trade could be a smart contract. I give you an Apple and we give it back to, uh, 
yeah, maybe give me money, whatever, in exchange. Um, what's interesting to note um, is that those smart contracts can't be changed once they sit on the blockchain. So basically, they have an address, a fixed address on the blockchain. So whoever has an, a wallet has an address, basically, and also a smart contract has an address similar to a wallet, and then you basically call to that address. But we're going to go deeper into this uh, later. This is just touch the surface. So I hope that makes a little more sense now. Ethereum is a decentralized platform that runs smart contracts. Yeah, and all the other stuff, uh, this is because it's decentralized. Um, well, yeah, distributed in that sense. Yeah, censorship, we talked about in the case of Turkey, Savasa, thanks for that picture. Uh, and yeah, third party interference and so on. So, okay. Okay, so now let's write a smart contract. How do we do that? Um, we use the language called Solidity. Solidity was created by the guys uh, behind Ethereum. Um, it is a language specifically designed to write smart contracts for the Ethereum blockchain. Um, this is the syntax, how it looks like. So three things I want to highlight here. It is a contract-oriented language. It sounds familiar. So it goes with things, object-oriented language, whatever. Um, you have a bunch of contracts. They're like, like classes. Um, actually, I'm going to go like this. Yeah, so they are basically classes you can inherit from other contracts. You import it first, and then you can inherit from that. Um, it is statically typed, which basically means you have to declare the type of a variable once you, uh, once you declare it. Um, and yeah, coming from the JavaScript world, structs has, was a little new to me, but other languages have this. So yeah, basically here, struct, this is how you write it. Um, this, is, this is basically an array of, of a uh, type called zombie in there. So this is from a tutorial called Crypto Zombies down here. Um, that is a really, really good introduction to uh, writing smart contracts with Solidity. Um, in the last slide, I have a bunch of resources that you uh, can check out. And this is how you do a mapping. So in that case, you map um, in, in IDs, which is an unset integer. This is what U int stands for, um, to an address. And address is, is baked in into Solidity. It's basically a hash of your address of your wallet, basically. Um, something to note also here, you have public, and you have something called internal. Uh, public means you can access this from outside of the smart contract. So you call it, and you get the information data. Internal. Um, means it's it's only you can only access it or call it from inside the smart contract. There's also something called private. Um, there's a slight difference there. And there's also something called external, which means I can only call it from outside of, of the smart contract. Um, yeah, this is how you declare functions. Um, the variables that it takes, you also have to define what what, um, what types there are. Um, yeah, and, but we're going to write our own smart contract in a second. So you will see this again. Um, Let's build our first decentralized app. Um, OK. So Felix, by the way, there's no timer. I find out. Um, <laughs> um, so we are on a code, coding school called Code Chrysalis. So I thought, OK, it would be cool to have an alternative coding school that is online and on the blockchain called Hack Butterfly. Uh, this is what we're going to build. And the idea with this, so I thought about, OK, what could be an interesting application for um, yeah, decentralized um, application. And I thought about something like that you would, could refer to as a transparency standard. So let's just imagine a scenario you're interviewing a candidate and this person went to Stanford. And something seems a little fishy about this person, so you have to background check this person a little bit. So you basically call up your friends at Stanford or a professor or some other people that went there at that class to, to really verify that this person went there. It takes a bunch of phone calls, it takes some time. Um, that sign up um, to this program, sending Ethereum. So you pay, uh, sending Ether. So you pay with Ether, which is the currency of Ethereum. Um, and then you're enrolled. And then once you're done with all the requirements, the school here um, can then turn your status from enrolled to graduated. So that's the idea. Um, and by the way, this is where the ownable uh, class comes from. Because they're, um, the school basically, when, if the school deploys the smart contract, the school is the owner with its address. And then only the school can call certain uh, functions on the blockchain. So there's some security that you could bake in there, but I'm not going to go too deep into this. Okay, how would you go about building this? Um, in a centralized way, what you would have is a central server. Uh, let's say it's a um, relational database with all your tables in there and all your students and the status. Um, there's an API that basically connects the database to your front end, um, and you would have just a simple front end. I think we, most people have done this here. Um, 
how would you go about decentral world? So you have the blockchain which serves as your backend. So there is no database. It's your blockchain. Um, and there are smart contracts that basically either read from that blockchain or can write to that blockchain. Basically, it's changed the state of the, of the blockchain based on the interactions that the users have or your students. Um, and then you need a front end. So that part didn't change. And there's something in between here that allows you to talk from the front end to the smart contracts. Um, that's basically an, an API that we're going to talk about in a second, which is now. Um, so for the blockchain part, we chose Solidity. Uh, we chose Ethereum as our stack. Um, for smart contracts, we do Solidity. And then this is this API that I mentioned. So this lives in here. So this allows the front end uh, to talk to the smart contract, basically. And I chose Vue.js for my front end. Um, it is a JavaScript uh, front end framework, similar to React. Um, I'm, I personally like Vue more than React, but that's, that's just taste. Um, we're not gonna go, like, we're not gonna do much with Vue, so if you're not familiar with it, don't, don't worry. That's, that's fine. Oh, by the way, I took those screenshots from another project called Lis. Um, they have a really good academy, by the way, if you wanna get deeper into this. Okay. So first, you're gonna uh, do the blockchain part. What do you think we have to do? Right, nothing. It's there. Um, you don't have to touch it at all. Um, it's, it's already there, that's great, it's public, um, you can use it. So the next step is we have to write our smart contracts in Solidity. Um, so let's do that, I'm just gonna put that here. Um, so this is how you write smart contracts. I'm gonna go, First, this could be overwhelming, but, so bear with me. Um, this is something called Remix. Um, it is also built from the guys at Ethereum. It's an, uh, an IDE that lives in the browser, um, and you basically write Solidity files with this. So on the left side, you see all your files here. Um, in our case, we have the Hack Butterfly demo, which is this here. It comes in with a ballot and ballot test, and there's some other stuff that I do, did also. But anyways, you don't have to look into this here. Um, dot .sol is the ending for Solidity files. And on the right side, there is your compiler, where you can compile your code and check it. Um, there's something called run. So when you click here, um, there's a bunch of stuff. So it's starting at the top. It, there's your environment. What's the environment you're at? So it says you have a bunch of options. You have the JavaScript virtual machine. Um, but what we look at is Injected Web 3. And what is Injected Web 3? Um, it is, and so Web3 gets injected by something that's called MetaMask. And what MetaMask is, as you see here, it's basically, um, so it is a Chrome extension that you can install on your on Chrome. Um, and it is a wallet that stores your Ether. And you can send transactions with this. You can send transactions, you can deposit more Ether in there. Um, and what's most interesting here is that it injects a Web3 instance in your window. So it basically has a little script that injects Web3 in it. That's why it's called Injected Web3. Um, this is MetaMask. I really like this. I don't know why. Um, this is how you get it. it yeah, I don't know. I could do this all day. Uh, anyways. So this is your account. Um, and then this is, yeah, this is your account, which is with a hash and how much Ether you have. So in our case, we now have 10 Ether, which is today about 3,200 USD. Um, don't worry, it is on the test net, so this is not my real money. Um, so there's a bunch of networks here. There's the main net, which then it would be real money and everyone could use it with real money. Um, there's test net that we want to use for testing purposes. So we don't want to test stuff on the main net, never ever. Um, then, yeah, you see on the right, we're on the Robson test net, so this also shows where we are. Um, there's something called gas limits. So gas is basically a fee that you have with every single transaction. And it's, it's a tiny amount of ether that you pay with every single transaction, basically. Um, and then you have value. So in this case, value is how much money, how much ether you sent with your transaction. Um, on the right side, you see something called VEI. Um, VEI is just a, um, a small, much, much smaller unit uh, of ether, basically. So ether shows us here. And how small this is, I want to show you here. This is one ether, and this is they in one ether. So five ether is a lot of they. Um, okay, that get. Just keep this in mind. We will get back to this later. Um, okay, so I hope this makes a little sense. This whole uh, thing here. Um, let's build our first smart contract. So in the beginning, we have to declare what version of Solidity we use, and then there's something called a pragma. You just write it there. 
basically. So pragma, solidity, and then the version. It's always there. Then we have our contract. We call this high butterfly. Um, first of all, we want to say say how much money really our uh, program costs. So we have an unsigned integer um, that is called program cost that we set to five ether. Um, ether is baked in into solidity because it's the currency of Ethereum. Like, makes sense to, to give it a yeah. It's not a variable. Um, student. So we want our struct called student. So how do we create our student here? So we have a struct um, struct called student. And what information do we want here? So let's say we want the age. And age could be an unset integer of 8 bit because people don't get that old. Um, say age. Um, then we have a string of, uh, string of first name. Uh, so we do first name. Then we have a string of last name. And what we want last is um, a status. So we're going to choose to have a string of a status. It's either enrolled or alumni, so we could technically also take a boolean here. But what if someone drops out? Or what if there's another status that we want to add later? So let's, let's, let's do it with a string. Um, once the student is created, the student should live in an array when I look them up, right? So how do we create an array? Um, it is an array that is of the uh, type student. Uh, oh, student. And this is going to be public, which means I can access this information from outside of the blockchain. And this is going to be called student accounts. Um, this is my array. And then second, I want, when I type in the ID of the student, I want to see the address of that student. So we're going to do a mapping here, um, where we map an unsigned integer, which is going to be the ID of the student, uh, to an address. An address is a, a type that is also basically solidity specific. Um, address is the hash and the address of your wallet, basically. Um, that's going to be public, because I wanted to access it publicly, and let's call it students. Um, yeah, by the way, I wrote some pseudocode up here, so that's easier to follow. Also for me. <laughs> um, next, we're going to declare a function. Um, so this is going to be the heart of our decentralized app. We want people to enroll into our program. Um, the way we do this, we're going to declare a function that we're going to call enroll student. And it takes a variable um, h, so it's an unsigned integer, 8-bit, called h. Um, you see this underscore that I took this from the, uh, from the crypto zombies tutorial. So basically variables you want to declare with an underscore in there. Um, and then string with uh, the first name. And then we have a string with a last name. Um, and now it's getting interesting because we want to make money with this. So this is external now. So people can call it from outside of this of the smart contract. And there's something called payable. And payable means that you send uh, a value with this. You send ether with this. You pay basically. It's a pay transaction. Um, this is all it takes to basically uh, enable people to pay me money. So whoever set up already a payment system and in like you know, standard uh, full stack app, or maybe use Stripe. This is even easier. It's just one word, payable, which makes you to accept money. Um, okay, so next, um, we want to first check if this person actually sent the money, the cost of the program. So what we do is something something's called require. So this is like an if statement. And it says from the message that someone sends, and a message is the transaction, basically. So we do message.value. And value is this here. Um, and this has to be our program cost. So we have program costs. Remember up here, we declared program cost to be 5 Ether. So if this person has sent 5 Ether with the transaction, we continue. If not, this function gets canceled, transaction gets reverted, nothing string right away that says it's a um, OK, so now our student exists now. Um, we want to put this now in the array of student accounts. So the way to do this, uh, similar to JavaScript, and you're going to do student accounts dot push, and then you push it into the array. And if you also come from the JavaScript world as I do, um, actually, wait. We want to first get a, an ID of the student. So answer integer called ID, yeah, which is student's account. So when you push something into an array, it returns you the length of the array afterwards from there. So ID in our case, if it's the first student, is one, but we want to start counting at zero. So we're going to do minus one here. 
And this should start with a zero then with the first student. Um, okay, good. So what do we need next? Next we have this mapping up here. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do students and just put in our ID in here and at that ID, so it's the first student again, it's gonna be student zero. Um, that's gonna be message.sender. And message.sender is basically the address of the person that sent this transaction. That's all. This is our all and uh, our whole enroll function. Um, there's a little helper function that I have down here that we don't really need, but I figured it would be interesting for, for learning purposes. Um, this is gonna return the total amount of students that we have in, in our school. So it's a function that's called get total students, um, which doesn't take anything. And in Solidity, you also have to declare what it returns. So you type in returns an unsigned integer. Oh, unsigned integer. Um, and I think you do public in here. So this is public as well, and only view. And view is a, is a new thing here. What it does, it, it says, I just read from the, from the blockchain. I don't write to it, I don't change the status, I just read from it. Um, and what all it does, it just returns the length of our array. So this is gonna be uh, no, no, student counts dot length. Okay, that's all. So this is a very simple MVP of our smart contract. Um, you're gonna check out the compiler if you've done any mistakes. So let's see, there is a mistake. So let's see what it has. Um, so these, these error messages are actually kind of useful. And um, by the way, also, if you, if you check out the documentation of Solidity, versions change really, really quickly. So in the documentation, something could be outdated, but I, I found while I built this that Remix, um, those little tooltips here are the most up-to-date. So there could be mistakes in the documentation still. Um, so you wanna, yeah, rely on this. Um, and it doesn't return, it returns a return. Yeah, and there's some other stuff here. What do we have? First name, last name. Did I miss something up on here? Query, string, string. Say the Kenny string name. underscore's missing. Right. Oh, thank you guys. See, this is why you do underscores in your variables. I guess. Um, wait, last name. Wait, what? Oh, oh, sorry. It's done. Compiled. Um, so compile is green. Good. Thank you guys. Um, so it compiled. Looks good. And now we are going to deploy this smart contract on the Robson test network. So what you do here is we have our account up here and we're not gonna send any value with this because we don't, we don't need to send value with, with, uh, with this yet because all we do is make money. We don't pay anyone yet. Um, so we're gonna deploy this here. So we click on deploy and then it creates this window, which is our friend MetaMask. So this guy, causes this window to pop up. And we have this gas fee, I hope you can read this, you can make this big, I don't know. yeah. So the gas <coughs> price, we're gonna increase this right now. So if you increase this, the transaction just goes through quicker, which means the miners just pick it up earlier and then it just goes quicker through the network. Um, since it's plain money anyways, we're just gonna increase this because we don't wanna wait. Um, I'm gonna confirm this transaction and this now writes to the Ethereum blockchain. You see this here, this is a link that we got um, it brings us to a website called Etherscan. So who's not familiar with this? Basically this um, is the website that shows all transactions that are going on on Ethereum, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, you see here, this is the Robson testnet. I can make it a little bigger. Um, this is our transaction hash, and it sees from who it's sent and to whom. And since it's a contract creation, we don't send it to anyone, we just send it to the blockchain. Um, and it gets basically right now sent here. Um, what you can also do uh, up there when you can analyze certain other um, distributed apps. So see basically who's interacting with this distributed app. So in the case of CryptoKitties earlier, you can literally see the transaction that is happening to the CryptoKitty decentralized app. And who's using it with how much money and, and all that stuff. Um, I, can, I can show this to you later. Let's see how this, okay, this is not, this is very slow. Um, as you can see, Transaction, um, the speed of transactions is really, really slow. Um, I'm gonna show you the CryptoKitty 
um, smart contract now. Uh, Crypt real bad. Smart contract. So as you can see, this is what I mentioned earlier with, you can literally see the smart contract here from CryptoKitties and the amount of transactions that are coming in and out and how much was sent there. Um, and whoever is new to this, you doesn't really say much. So ERC20 tokens is basically Ether. Uh, or some, no, yeah, or some other tokens on the Ethereum blockchain if you start um, the project. So most ICOs are ERC20 tokens. ERC721 are the collectibles, so they're unique. Um, yeah, this is a whole bit of other lecture on another day. Um, but what's interesting here is that they show you the code of their smart contract. So what we just wrote, you can see that from the CryptoKitties guys. Um, I can scroll down here, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, so you see there's a cooldowns here that they declared and, and all sorts of things. So if you're interested, you can check this out. This is what I meant with transparency. So when you call the smart contract in the CryptoKitties game, you know exactly what you're getting into because the smart contract is there. Um, I hope this is done now. Yeah, okay, that took a while. So the, our transaction is done. Our contract was created, so let's click on this. Um, so now this is our contract address up here. It's big enough, I assume I am. Um, and as a balance of zero ether, because no one has paid us yet. Okay, so this is now sitting here. Let's interact with our first smart contract. So this has been confirmed. Um, it is down here now. So I can see get total students. How many students do we have? Zero. Okay, that's obvious. Uh, let's sign up. So let's say uh, we want to send five ether and enroll a student. Let's enroll myself. So I'm 26. First name is Michael. Last name is Arnold. Um, and let's enroll myself. So it opens up a transaction window here again. This time, however, you see there's a bunch of money that is attached to this. It's big enough. Um, this is 5 Ether and our gas fee. I'm going to, uh, this is, the zoom is a little weird. Uh, let's increase this again and save this and confirm this. And let's hope that this gets through a little quicker this time. Um, when we click here, so you see now um, it's sent again from my wallet address, from my hash, um, to the smart contract. And as you can see here, the value is 5 Ether. So we're sending 5 Ether with that transaction to the smart contract, uh, basically. And yeah, this is a transaction hash, same as the one up here. Um, and we could now wait for this to finish. Um, what I could also show you guys is... Um, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's done. Okay. Let's, let's, let's refresh this. Okay, so this has been done now. This is a little tick here. And this is our contract. And our contract now has five Ether sitting in the contract. So now we made our first money. Um, we could, if you were the school, then also get that money out of the contract through a function that is only called by the owner. This is where this comes in handy. Um, but yeah, so now we check out the students here. So we have now one student. And if you check out the student's account, so we said that we start towning at zero. So let's do this. And it returns us Michael Arnold, enrolled 26. So this information sits now on the Ethereum testnet. And we now deployed our first smart contract. Um, and it works, and the information's in there. Okay, so Solidity, uh, we've looked into this, we deployed our first smart contract. So this is done now. Um, what's missing now of this whole full stack decentralized app? are two things, the base is the front end, and the front end with the Ethereum API to call functions uh, through our front, front end on the smart contract. Um, Solidity has been the main part here, so the front end stuff is going to be very quick and short, so bear with me, this is how we basically put all the pieces together now. Um, okay, let's look into view and Web3 and what that all is. Um, this is Visual Studio Code, probably seen that now, with, of, yeah, also with the other students. And this is a simple view uh, project. Don't worry too much about it. There are components. So the idea of React and Vue is that you have your uh, whole front end and several components that you have. Um, this is just simple HTML um, here and some styling. Don't worry about this. Worry about this stuff. Um, but before we dive into this, 
I want to show you the final product. So this is how the front end looks like. So the code that we just saw, that's the front end. It's live on Heroku. You can check it out. If you have money, you can uh, sign up with test money, not real money. Um, yeah, so you have your first name, last name, age, and your students here and alumni. So I've added some alumni stuff. Um, Jens Tan is one of our alumni. So the school has to be, has to be good. Um, so yeah, so I added a little bit of a bunch of stuff that the school, as I said, can then turn a student into alumni once it's done. Um, oops, I'm getting too fast. And then, and then I have this instance here. And there's two things that we can get. So if I jump back, uh, what you see up here, my address and my balance, um, the way to get that data is this here. So this is a simple um, promise that we have with async and await. Um, and what we do is we want to do web3.eth, stands for Ethereum, um, and then you do a function or a method called get Coinbase. And this is how you grab your address, your Coinbase, basically. Um, the next one is get balance from a specific address. So we save that Coinbase here first, and then we grab that balance basically from that user. And remember when I mentioned Vey and Ether, so it gives you the data in Vey, this really, really small uh, unit of Ether. So we divide this by this, and then we get back the Ether unit. Um, OK. Now, how do we get the contract? How do we get the con initiate a new contract instance? And this is how it, where it gets interesting. So what we do is here, we set, create a new instance of Web3, so new Web3, ETH, uh, called contract. So this is, we just um, create a new contract instance from that smart contract that we created. And it takes a few variables back here. So the first one is called ABI. It stands for Application Binary Interface. It's written here. Um, it sounds more fancy than it actually is. All it really is, it's a bunch of instructions how to interact with that contract. So this is an example of an ABI. Um, you see here, enrolled student. It's payable. It's true. Can you mutate the state? Yeah, it's payable. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other stuff, graduate student, and so on. So don't worry about this. Um, if you want to do it yourself, where you get this from, remember we go back to Remix, um, and you go to this compiler tab, and you go to details. And then this detail spits you out the ABI. You just copy paste, and then you have it. So very straightforward. Um, and then you get the contract address. So remember before I showed you on Etherscan our contract address. Uh, in our case, I, I saved it here, um, this hash. It's a different one now, because it's the one that I updated with a bunch more stuff. Um, and this is optional, the stuff here in the yellow curlies. Um, this is a default gas price that we set with our transaction. And the next one is a default address from this is going to send from, um, which is the, the address that we grabbed. And we just send it, set it to five because we just want to be quicker. Um, you can also just leave this out if you want it. And yeah, and then we have our contract, which sits as hack butterfly contract. Um, yeah, this is, this is, view specific. I don't want to get into this, but now let's say we want to grab all the students that we have. So how do we do that? How do we go about that? Um, this is a method that is also asynchronous. Um, that's going to be called total students. Uh, that's going to be the result of it. It's a promise again. Um, the way to do this is that you grab that uh, contract instance that we just created basically, um, and then do dot methods. And then if you do dot methods and you console log this, you see all those different methods and functions in your smart contract. So then you just grab the one that you want, which in our case is get total students. And you don't, shouldn't forget this thing. So you have to call this. So this is how you call that function in your smart contract. That's all. Um, as, as easy as that. So you grab this. It's a promise. So you wait your promise. And then you have your students. And once you have the amount of students, you then uh, go through the array of students, and for every single student, basically, you grab that data. This is what the next lines of code do. Um, so there's another one called get student, which is defined down here in line 93. Um, and then what it does, it calls the function called student accounts with the ID that we have, and the ID is from the loop that we have here, and then also calls it. So this is, if you now jump back, this is how you... Uh, get all the students here. And then there's some logic. Basically, we have two uh, different uh, arrays. It's either student array, so if it's uh, enrolled, we push it into students. If it's graduate, we push it into alumni. Um, that's literally all it does. And now let's look at this thing here. Let's look at how to sign up and actually send money. It is 
a little different, but actually similar. So this is the enroll um, component. And I just want you to look at this here. So line 106. Um, don't worry about this if statement. So all that does is, is it checks if this has been checked. It's not the safest way to check if all the information is in there, but let's just live with that for now. Um, okay, so we have our contact instance. We do methods, similar to what we've done before. Then we enroll the student with all that stuff here. So if you remember, in Remix, our enrolled student function takes an H, first name, last name. So we pass in now the age, first name, and last name that we get through the signup form. Um, and then instead of call that we saw in the previous examples, we do dot send because it actually sends money that sends value um, to the smart contract. And what it sends, it's basically the program cost that you defined earlier, so the five meter. Um, yeah, and then we, we await this and done. And then we have a student. So this is how you, how you enroll and do that. Uh, we could do this here right now. So. Michael is actually still missing down here. So let's do Michael. Arnold, still 26. Yes, it's correct. Um, same stuff. So, so we grab now the MetaMask, and this creates this MetaMask transaction. Um, and we see now in this edit, this is already at 5, because we set the default to 5. And we're going to confirm this transaction. Um, and now it's send off the way we, how we see this. So they, could be some front end nice stuff here to see a spinner, which I haven't done. But you see the uh, transaction here. So this is submitted instead of confirmed. So we click here, and this is the the thing that we, we already saw. That this is not new to us. Um, yeah. So the pending transaction could take a while. So I'm not going to wait now for this. We've seen this, um, and and it works. Yeah. And once this is done, when I refresh this, Michael Arnold is also down here. We can come back to this later. I'm not going to spend time now on on, on waiting. Um, okay, so this has been the front end. Hope it wasn't too rushed. It's been a lot. Um, so let's just quickly recap before we finish this uh, this whole thing. Um, first of all, what we have to do is we build we build our smart contract in Solidity, and we use Remix as our IDE and to deploy that smart contract to the blockchain. Um, as I said, with deploying uh, Remix and something called EtherScan, um, there we see our transactions and we see basically some bunch of other interesting stuff. So if you're interested there, actually check out Etherscan and really dive into this. It's really interesting. Um, then we have to connect it to our front and use Web3 um, and something called AB, uh, ABI and our address of the contract. And lastly, um, to way to interact with our decentralized apps, uh, we use MetaMask. There's some other examples, other tools you can use. Um, I chose MetaMask, which is this injected Web3 that I talked about. And that's all. This is how you build your full stack decentralized app. Um, summary. So we talked about data transparency, trust. We talked about apples. We talked about centralized versus decentralized and smart contracts and uh, yeah, full stack decentralized app. If you want to get started yourself, this is what helped me uh, reading this. So I had I had like a high level surface idea of, of blockchain crypto stuff, but mostly from the business side of things. So I started. I would say a month ago to dive into the tech side of things. So this really helped me um, to, to learn all that. All those links you can find on my repository. That repository is the code base of what you just saw. So if you are familiar with Vue, this is a really, really good boilerplate to get started. Um, this readme here contains a bunch of information I talked about, the MetaMask plugin, how to get test money for your Robson uh, uh, wallet, basically. Um, there's some introduction stuff, some useful links, and lastly, um, the links that I mentioned here, crypto zombies and whatnot, and some interesting projects. If you're interested to learn more about this, check those projects out. So the first one, it's called Truffle. Um, every serious smart contract, or most serious smart contract developers actually use Truffle, which is like a, t uh, a whole suite of tools that also give you unit tests, so you can write real unit tests for your smart contracts. Um, it also comes with uh, its own uh, blockchain to test stuff, so you don't have to do the test testnet. Could be a little longer because you saw you saw the transaction that took a while. If you do a bunch of stuff every day, it's going to get very very slow. Um, yeah, this is the link here, and that's it from me. Thank you very much.